first performed on October 31st by Lady Elizabeth's Men at London's Hope Theatre, Barthelmy Fair had its second performance before King James I the following day. An immediate success, it was the last of Johnson's truly great plays. In some respects, it is a morality play, one that represents a literary subcategory of the European Renaissance, the literature of fools. At the annual Smithfield Fair held on St. Barthelmy's Day, August 24, Johnson assembles a representative selection of the citizens of London. Each character, however, also typifies some form of human vice or folly, and their names provide the keys. The fair swirls with figures like the doting but foolish husband Littlewit, his initially honest but eventually corruptible wife, Wynne, short for Win the fight, not Winifred, and Wynne's widowed mother Dame Purecraft. Purecraft and one of her fortune-hunting suitors, Zelif the land busy, represent and satirize ignorant, proselytizing, grasping Puritans who loudly proclaim virtue and denounce vice but who are themselves running confidence schemes to bilk their more simple-minded co-religionists of their money. The cast also features an overzealous justice of the peace, Adam Overdue, who attends the fair in disguise to root out abuses but who regularly misidentifies them. We meet as well Overdue's brother-in-law, Barthelmy Cox a well-to-do and credulous young man who willingly contributes to his own robbing and victimizing at the hands of every crook and con artist at the fair. He has a paid companion, Humphrey Wasp, who buzzes with anger at any remark addressed to him. Cox is betrothed to Grace Wellborn, who is anxious to be rid of her gullible husband-to-be. Other figures attending the fair include Winwife, another suitor for the hand and fortune of Dame Purecraft, and the man after whom Purecraft lusts, Winwife's friend Corliss. Also in attendance is a pathetically mad figure named Trouble All. The fair's personnel and hangers-on include sellers of goods such as Lantern Leatherhead, who trades in hobby horses, Joan Trash, who hawks gingerbread, and the mistress of the fair's misrule. Ursula the pig woman whose roast pork is one of the fair's main attractions and her bartender, Mooncalf. Also selling his wares is a vendor of broadside ballads, Nightingale. Nightingale's performances give his pickpocket confederate Ezekiel Edgeworth opportunities to take purses from his rapt listeners. Others who ply their dubious trades at the fair include Punk Alice a prostitute described as Mistress O' the Game, and pimps Captain Wit and Jordan Knockham, who convince Wynne that a prostitute's life is preferable to that of an honest wife. The fair, in short, represents the vanities, vices, and follies of the world in a setting populated by Londoners typical both of its citizens and of people everywhere with similar follies and vices. The play opens with a stagekeeper appearing to apologize for the delay in beginning the performance. Taking the audience into his confidence, the stagekeeper pokes fun at the play's author, at his assistant, and at the play itself. The prompter then appears and sends the stagekeeper away. After this the prompter reads a long pseudo-contract between the author and the audience. This contract requires each member of the audience to arrive at an independent judgment of the play and to promise not to try to find allusions to celebrated persons hidden among the characters. After this, the play proper begins by establishing the initial characteristics of the Little Wits, Coax, Wasp, Dame Purecraft, Corliss, and Busy. It also develops the device by which the little wits manage to get the Puritans pure craft and busy to a fair at all. Wynne pleads pregnancy and an all-consuming desire to eat some of the wonderful roast pig at the fair. This overcomes the objections of Busy, who decides that by eating pork he can demonstrate his disdain of Jews. The play's last act features a puppet show within a play and Little Wit's pathetic grief at his wife's fall, 
to which his own neglect and folly principally contributed. In the last act too, Justice Overdue actually learns that his overzealous pursuit of wrongdoing was foolish. The large number of characters and the almost cinematic changes of scene at the fair may make the play initially confusing for a reader. The same attributes, however, delighted then, and now delight, most viewers of a good production. One segment of the Renaissance audience, however, remained unamused. The play's unflattering portrayal of Puritans added impetus to their demands for the closing of the theatres in England. 